Thank you, and thank you to this band. Wow, what a great way to lead us in worship. Thank you. Amazing. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad. And let's rejoice. I love it. You're going to hear that from me many times through the years. One of my favorite verses. Great way to start worship. It's a wonderful way to greet every single day. And it seems like a perfect starting point for today. This is the day. In fact, by my estimation, this day has been at least six months in the making. <laughs> at least from my awareness, anyway. Probably longer than that. A year. Uh, uh, a year. <laughs> This is the day. What I know is that God has engineered, God has manufactured this day with a little help from an excellent pastor nominating committee. And I want to say a special word of thanks to Bob and Sue and, and Judy and Rose and Lynn and Bill and, and uh, Ron and Bob. And if there's anybody here on the PNC, I know there are a couple, would you please stand up for a moment? If you're here on the PNC, all right, there's Judy and Bill. Ron, oh, Ron, good. You know, I can't vouch for their judgment. <laughs> but I can tell you, they were wonderful to work with. And they represented North Lake beautifully. A lot of fun, a lot of faith, uh, many probing questions, and a lot of prayer together. So my, my, uh, my gratitude to all of them and to this process. This is a day that's so natural for me to rejoice and be glad and to be a part of uh, the faith community and the staff that includes pastors Mike and Dan and Dave, so many others who are on that team serving Jesus as a part of North Lake. I, I want to direct a special word of thanks. He won't be expecting this, but Administrator Tom Ledoux, who's here, has been a special uh, help, very attentive to me in the weeks leading up to, to my arrival. So thank you so much. Where, where is Tom? Right here. Thank you, Tom. You know, it's an honor to be part of the, the leadership lineage of North Lane. And this is a morning when I want to acknowledge with gratitude, I want us to say thanks to God for, for Pastor Denny Dennison. Yes. His, his warmth and his vision have fueled North Lake for a decade and a half, and, and we all know that these recent months have been uh, emotionally draining for him with the loss of his dear Sandy and with all the layers of change that are going on in his life. My wife Bobby and I were blessed to spend a few moments with, with Denny and Sandy at the end of May. Uh, it was uh, a very tender time to pray with her at hospice uh, just a few days uh, before she received her resurrection eyes and perspective. But it was truly a blessing to see, to witness uh, her very faithful and, and tender acknowledgement of God's hand on her life. And then he was very gracious with his time as well. He afforded me a few minutes to sit down and talk together about North Lake, to begin to get acquainted, to pray for our relationship and for a healthy transition. And I'm so thankful for that. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and we'll be glad in it. Let me also tell you that all the way in Ohio, the music ministry of North Lake reached me. On another Sunday, I'll tell you how it happened. Uh, but uh, the music ministry of this service and of the sanctuary uh, extends far beyond Central Florida and reached me up in Cincinnati. And it's an exciting part for me to, to be here. Now, speaking of Cincinnati, the, the Northminster Presbyterian Church, where I served for 22 years, I got, a, I got an email late last night that Northminster at all three services this morning, they are praying for you. <laughs> they said, you may need some extra prayers. <laughs> and in fact, uh, on my last Sunday there, uh, it, was, it was beautiful. Uh, they commissioned me to come here as pastor. Uh, for for uh, the conclusion of the service, my wife Bobby and I and other family members who could be present were brought to the center of the sanctuary and everybody came and laid hands on us and, and prayed. They, and they prayed specifically for North Lake and for this partnership and for all that God may have in store for the future. 
And it was a, a wonderful thing. I just want you to know that they are praying uh, for us this morning. Um, now, there's a, there's a fantastic partner in life and ministry who is here with me this morning. I want to ask her to stand up for a minute. Bobby, will you stand up for just a second? Yeah. I will not do this every Sunday. But I just want to say to you, you know, I, I asked Bobby, she'd listen very carefully at the first and second services so she can give the message at the third. <laughs> and she politely declined. She insists that's not her calling, although I think she can actually do very well. Uh, but she did offer to, to greet with me afterwards, and we sure look forward to being a part of the family that is North Lake. Uh, and family uh, includes David and Kelly, my, our older son, and our daughter-in-law, and... Cassidy, who is just about to turn six months, who went out of the room with the other children. <laughs> Guess what? Yesterday was their moving day. Their moving day. First, first house that they bought, and they were actually moving into it yesterday. You know, we just, you know, it's amazing all the things that converged on the start of this month. And so we're glad that they can be here with us. On Tuesday and Wednesday, Bobby and I were working with packers and movers. Um, only to discover that the Packers had put into a box all the clothes and shoes that I had set aside for this week. <laughs> they were in the safe pile that they weren't supposed to touch, all packed up. Fortunately, it was discovered in time so that by the next morning before it got buried too deeply into the moving van, they could get the right box and bring it up. My dad had said, you know, Jeff, it's going to be really unfortunate if the first time ever you preach in t-shirt and, sh and, and tennis shoes. Praise God. Yeah? <laughs> that would work. It might work better at some services than others. <laughs> Thursday afternoon, uh, we had our closing on the house to sell it in Ohio. We hopped in the car cars, because we had to drive caravan, and headed down. We arrived late Friday night at my parents, who they, they live in Leesburg. And uh, it's wonderful having this proximity of family. David and Kelly live closer to Orlando. So you can just sense our thrill to be a part of North Lake, but then to have four generations uh, all together is wonderful. Uh, I was afraid I'd feel a little bit like a paratrooper preacher, and kind of landing at the X spot. And so I came over yesterday, instead of helping them pack, I had a couple meetings, and then I spent hours here in the office that will become a new home, and then praying in these worship spaces. And I, I came and, and prayed in here uh, extensively, and, and over in the sanctuary, and prayed for the band and for all of the folks who would be here, and prayed for the message, and just for the start, and for all the elements of so the communion and, that we share together. Uh, tomorrow, by the way, I'll, I'll sit down uh, and, and, and be with the staff and then uh, the beginnings of worship planning for next Sunday. And then in the afternoon, we have the closing on another house. <laughs> house we're buying here in Florida. And in the midst of all this, in the midst of all of that crazy, wonderful stuff, what a thrill it is to share the word and the sacrament with all of you. It is a thrill. Amen. Thank you. It's a thrill. Let's pray. God of wisdom and grace, speak to us now through your word so that we can hear and understand, take it into our hearts, and carry it with us into the week ahead. In the name of the word made flesh, we pray. Amen. Luke was the writer of the verse that we're going to focus on this morning, and I've highlighted on the slide a couple of uh, phrases that I want to uh, be something we'll look to God to help us and to challenge us with. So this is Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and ordinary men, they were amazed and recognized them as companions of Jesus. Let's spend a few moments with this great verse. I've not preached on it before, but it's one that has always caught me. And I thought this is a great place to start with North Lake. First, who is they? Who's Luke referring to at the start of the sentence? Well, the they is the Jewish council, an assembly that was known as the Sanhedrin. It had rulers and elders and priests and scribes. 
It was just a few months earlier that Jesus had been crucified and, and these leaders thought that they had taken care of the rabble that was following Jesus. The, the disciples, they, they, they went into hiding. They went to an upper room and they were waiting and waiting and waiting for a day that we know was Pentecost. Pentecost was the big splash event for the Holy Spirit. It was the birthday of the church, the grand opening. They had a marquee preacher that day named Peter. According to the scriptures, when he preached that first Pentecost, there were 3,000 people or so who came to faith in Jesus Christ. And for all that, he still didn't even get his name in an advertisement in the Daily Sun. <laughs> and when it was time to follow up on that, he went to teach at the temple portico. And on the way in, on another day, John and, and Peter, John and Peter paused to heal a, a beggar who was lame, who needed help. And their help, their healing for that man aroused even more fuss among the Jewish leaders. They were especially annoyed that, that Peter and John were talking about some kind of resurrection from the dead. And so they had Peter and John arrested. They were taken into custody. They're held overnight for an interrogation the next day. Let's just see how this unfolds now as Luke tells it in the verses leading up to our focus verse. Let's look at Acts chapter 4 beginning at verse 5. The next day their rulers and elders and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. When they had made the prisoners stand in their midst, they inquired, by what power, by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we're questioned today, because of a good deed done to someone who was sick and are asked how this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by the builders Yet it has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. Friends, that's a bold statement. Peter looks into the eyes of those who have power over him, and he says, you rejected the stone that became the cornerstone of salvation. He says, you crucified the one whom God raised from the dead. And he makes a singular claim for the uniqueness of Jesus and for the power of his name. It's an extraordinary moment we shouldn't miss. Peter's answer in the interrogation reminds me a little bit of this edited photo cartoon. Do one brave thing today, <laughs> then run. Except Peter couldn't run and didn't need his intrepid testimony is there and, and he doesn't run. He didn't have the opportunity at that moment. But the text tells us so they saw the boldness. They saw the boldness of Peter and John. By the way, this is the first time in Luke's writing that he uses the word for boldness. Now, now Luke writes both the gospel that bears his name, and the book of Acts, okay? So he goes all the way through the gospel, doesn't use the word bold. And he goes three chapters. So it's a total of 27 chapters he's written. He's never mentioned boldness until he gets to our focus verse, verse 13. And there he mentions boldness, and not just once, but twice more in this chapter. This is a turning point of boldness. And it's even observable, it's palpable in Peter and John. This is a moment that's to be noticed for, for the boldness. When the council tried to intimidate Peter and John, and they made threats against them, 
They said, you know, you're going to have to decide whether it's right for us to follow God or follow you. We can't help doing what we're called to do. We're going to give witness to what we've seen and heard, no matter what you threaten us with. So the Jewish council, they, they were really puzzled what to do with these irksome, defiant witnesses. They issued a few more threats, and then they released them. Peter and John go back, and they rejoin the other believers. They give them a, a full report, and then they begin to pray. And that prayer is extraordinary. And I want you to see what, what gets prayed in verse 29. Now, Lord, look at their threats. Now, Lord, look at their threats and grant to your servants to speak your word with all boldness. Speak your word with all boldness. Lord, help us to speak your word with boldness. What a splendid prayer. Sometimes when I look at what people pray for, I like to notice what they didn't pray for. Right? You notice what they didn't pray for. They didn't pray for things to get easier. They prayed for the boldness to deal with the things the way they were. I, I, I think of myself at times, it's so easy for me to pray that things will just get easier. You know, I might have been praying, Lord, would it be okay if I just hang, hang out for a little while longer in the upper room until this gets, kind of cools down a bit? You know, would it be okay, Lord, if I have a lower profile for a while till, till the heat is off? Or, Lord, would you please just get rid of those Jewish leaders so that I can preach the good news on Hampton? And there's a lot of things they could have prayed. Don't pray for a way to backpedal from threats and hardship. Pray for the fortitude and the courage to lean forward in the name of Jesus Christ. And they do. That's how they pray. Then Luke summarizes this narrative in verse 31. Guess what word shows up at the tail end of this? Boldness, boldness. Here, here's his summary. When they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God with, everybody? Boldness, with boldness. By the way, when I was here yesterday, that's what I was praying praying that this place would be shaken, not just today, but in the days ahead, in the weeks and months and years ahead, and that we'd be filled with, this, with the Holy Spirit, and, and that we would all together be spokespersons for God's word of love and grace and truth, and to do so with boldness. The Greek word for boldness was actually created by putting two together. It took the word all, and the word speaking and put them together, all speaking. And it's a word that had a connotation that, that you could be very frank, you could say everything that needed to be said. A boldness or freedom to speak up. Now by the way, that doesn't give us license for the kind of bombastic and abrasive rhetoric that's all too common among politicians or in other elements of our world. It doesn't give us license to go behind the anonymity of the internet. And to show and throw things out there, comments that are caustic or, or hurtful or bullying. But this freedom to speak and to say what needs to be said, this is reminding us that in the first century as well as in the 21st century, there are cultural forces that try to squelch our ability to speak up for Jesus Christ. A year ago at graduation in California, in Brawley, California, one of the graduating students slated to speak at commencement was told that he could not mention Jesus Christ in his address. Brooks Hamby, who's a bright young man, he's now at Stanford University, received national attention after his speech was redacted three times by school officials, and he was threatened. He said, you may lose your privilege of speaking at all. He modified what he planned to say but he didn't relinquish his opportunity to be a witness in a clear and respectful manner. In fact, he even had a clever way of referring to Jesus by quoting from the Sermon on the Mount without identifying it and talking about being the salt of the earth. Now, his, his total address was less than two minutes, but it was brilliant. And 
It included a couple sentences like this. In coming before you today, I presented three drafts of my speech, all of them denied on account of my desire to share my personal thoughts and inspiration to you in my Christian faith. And then he finished at the end, may the God of the Bible bless each and every one of you every day for the rest of your lives. Principled boldness. And the rest of the student body, all of the fellow students, erupted with applause for him. He did a courageous thing, and he did not run. He didn't run. Peter and John established their boldness before the Jewish council. They were not intimidated. They were not coerced. And it says then uh, that the leaders saw, they recognized that they were uneducated and ordinary men. Uneducated and ordinary. By the way, in Greek, it's a grammatoi and idiotai. A grammatoi means basically no grammar. They weren't instructed in the proper way to speak. They hadn't been trained in how to talk. Actually, I think Peter does pretty well in what he says and writes. <laughs> but they didn't have the kind of training that would have been expected. And idiotai is, is the basis for our English word idiot, only in the Greek, it had no connotation of mental deficiency. It simply meant common. Uh, it meant no status or ordinary. Peter and John, they were not headed to Stanford. They were not Phi Beta Kappa. They were not going to make it on the geek squad. They were uh, not the Jewish Honor Society. They had no qualifications, no ped pedigree as such. But they were unpolished guys with a good word about Jesus. And that's enough. Three summers ago, <laughs> I was in a remote region of Guatemala as a part of a small mission team that was trying to discern where would our church make its next long-term global mission partnership. And it was an extraordinary opportunity to visit a, a lot of different communities. We were focused on the Kekchi people. That's one of more than 20 uh, indigenous groups uh, in, in Guatemala of Mayan descent. Some of their leaders speak Spanish. Most of the people only speak their native language of Kekchi. And, and uh, it was a wonderful experience. Among our many stops was the, the God with us evangelical church, Presbyterian church in an isolated village. And I was, I was invited to, to, to preach there at their service. And actually, for, for the location of the church, it was an extraordinary structure. And it filled with hundreds of people who came for the worship service. Through the years, I've preached in cross-cultural settings a half dozen or more times with the help of a translator. I have never before experienced double translation. <laughs> so what happens is I would say a, a few sentences in English and then the person beside me at the microphone would speak those in Spanish and then the person a little further over with the handheld microphone would take it from Spanish into Kekchi. It was really a, a, an amazing process. Uh, I, I was really thought, wow, this is, this is, I remember watching the faces of the congregation. You know, so for a few seconds, they'd be focused on me. Then they would turn to the person beside me. All right? Then the eyes would go to the one over there with the microphone. Then there'd be a pause, and they'd look back at me again. <laughs> like, okay, okay. It was uh, a really interesting experience. And trying to do any humor or to tell a story is, 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 is very hard because <laughs> the process is so cumbersome. By the time they get back, it's like, let's see, where were we? <laughs> it... Uh, I've never felt more dependent on the Holy Spirit for preaching. And it was, it was a bit bold, truly it was. Uh, nobody was threatening me. But actually the boldest part of that service occurred before the message. Now prior to the message, there was a little bit more than an hour of exuberant music and praying. It was loud and it was lively and it was glorious. When it came time for the message, the host pastor was most gracious. And uh, he said some very kind things, and he finished his welcome um, by suggesting that I sing something in English before I begin to preach. 
My family's laughing. <laughs> now, I love music. I love worship music. I love it when others lead me in worship with their good music. But I am not the song leader. Um, I will never take the place of any of our vocalists in the band. Uh, you can be assured of that. In fact, I'm sure that they will be glad that when they're leading, that my joyful noise is somewhere over here. <laughs> when it comes to singing, I am a grammatoi and idiotai. <laughs> I have a about three notes that I can hit, and I might miss one of those. Right? So now I've been introduced to an enthusiastic Guatemalan congregation, and my translator explains that they are waiting for me to sing something. <laughs> I looked down in the front row where my teammates were, and I beckoned them up. <laughs> I beckoned them up. One's a cardiac care nurse, another one is a, a nurse who specializes in organ transplant patients. Another one, a, a dear friend, has two PhDs, including one that's in economic and, and environmental sustainability. These are great folks. They can't sing a lick. <laughs> but if I'm going to sing, it's not going to be a solo. <laughs> I beckon them up, and as they're coming on up, I'm thinking of a proposal. We also had our translator join us, who's an American friend serving in Guatemala. Together, we sang our hearts out in a rousing but forgettable rendition of Amazing Grace. And what was most amazing, what grace was most obvious and apparent, was their applause when we finished singing. <laughs> or maybe they were just glad we were done. <laughs> but you know, they legitimately wanted, they wanted to see if our hearts were in it. They wanted to see if our hearts were in it. They didn't care about any of our pedigrees, our background, any of the other credentials. They didn't care a lick about that. But they wanted to know, and they had a right to see, if we loved Jesus. And we became, in that worship service, a company. We became together companions of Jesus. Remember that focus verse says the Jewish council were amazed and recognized Peter and John as companions of Jesus. It was the key to their identity. It was key to their boldness. They were companions of Jesus. Not rabbinical school, not any formal training. It was just being with Jesus that defined it. Do others recognize you and me as companions of Jesus? Do they recognize us as companions of Jesus? I'm an avid learner. I'm a lifelong learner. But I'll never consider myself to be learned. Like Peter, I just want to be a companion of Jesus. I want for North Lake to be filled with companions of Jesus. And Peter said it well when he wrote in his second epistle. He said to them that we would grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to keep growing in that companionship with Jesus. So every week we'll be, we'll be learning together and, and, and trying to understand what it means, like, like the prophet said, what does it mean to be a disciple? How do we follow? How do we carry that off of this campus and out into the world? Both words, companion and company, are derived from a Latin root. Come upon us with bread. Come upon us with bread. I just let that sink in for a moment. Let that sink in. With bread. The whole notion was breaking bread with somebody creates relationships. There were disciples who were leaving Jerusalem on their way to Emmaus after reports an eerie story about an empty tomb and the resurrection of Jesus. They're still puzzled about all that. 
There's a stranger walking alongside of them. And it's only when they break bread, when they have that company moment with Jesus, that they realize that Jesus himself has been their traveling companion. And they are bread fellows with Jesus. And here when we come to a table like this, we are in company with Jesus, with each other at North Lake and with Jesus. We are in good company. Can I hear an amen? amen. We are in good company with Jesus and with each other. We share together in a sacred meal. We are bread fellows with the living Lord. We break bread to remember and to partner with him in his kingdom work. And I guarantee this, that when we spend time with Jesus, when we are in company with Jesus, it stirs boldness. It activates boldness. So in the moments that we're having communion and, and there'll be moments of reflection that are upcoming, think about one bold, kind, loving thing you'll do this week in the name of Jesus. You don't have to limit it to one. I hope that there'll be many moments that you might, you might recognize as an opportunity to be bold. But be intentional and select and commit to something you're going to do that's a little bit out of the ordinary, something that takes a little more courage. And think about how will you live that boldness this week? If you want to let me know what you've decided or how it turns out, I'd love to hear from you. You could drop off a note at the office or send me an email. I'd love to have a look at the boldness of North Lake in the weeks and months ahead. How will we carry that out? Let's pray. Almighty God, look at us. Look at us. We, we don't have all the training we think we need or expertise or skills. But yes, we're here today as companions of Jesus. So please, please, Stir the boldness in us that we may be the caring witnesses you desire in Central Florida. We pray to you, God, in the name of the cornerstone of salvation, Jesus Christ. Amen.